All right. Make sure you get some delicious lunch. If you're behind the wall and studying, come get some lunch and join us for a conversation about public-private partnerships. <laughs> All right. 
We are so excited to welcome Mary Margaret Frank over from the other side of grounds today. <laughs> Um, as many of you already know, because she's been really engaged in the tri-sector leaders, uh, Mary Margaret Frank is an associate professor of business administration at the Darden School of Business and the academic director of the Institute for Business and Society. In her role as academic director, she champions initiatives ranging from public-private partnerships to UVA's tri-sector leadership fellow program, which is a collaboration between Darden, Batten, and the law school. Um, as many of you know, here with the Social Entrepreneurship Initiative, we're really championing the similar projects of public-private partnerships and collective impact, and so we're super excited to hear about her research um, and teaching today. Her work is on the intersection of private, government, and public sector engagement, and she's the recipient of numerous awards in this area, including the Faculty Pioneer Award from the Aspen Institute, she currently serves on the board of directors for the Female Health Company, a publicly traded company that focuses on empowering women to lead healthy lives. Her experience with the Female Health Company inspired a course at UVA for UVA grad students entitled Public-Private Partnerships, Fighting HIV AIDS in the US, as well as organizing experiences to South Africa for Darden students. So without any more delay, we're going to introduce her to talk about her work P3 to C3, the evolution of cross-sector engagement. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear myself, so. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I have to give a little background. Uh, all of that doesn't, none of that really said, I am actually a tax professor, which is fine. I kind of like people not to know that I'm a tax professor because that, all, that skews how people look at me sometimes. So, just so you know, my background, actually, I was a, I was a practicing tax accountant. And you might wonder how a tax accountant, I'm going to put this right here, Tax accountant goes from doing tax planning and specifically corporate tax planning into what we might call cross-sector collaboration, cross-sector engagement. And the way I sort of think about it is taxes are one of the very first and simplest public-private partnerships. The government's just particularly silent in the sense that they pass the tax code and then they allow the private sector to engage. But it's still a contract tax code is just a very large contract with regards to how the private sector and the public sector will engage. The thing that I kind of got a little tired of was that when I was teaching, it was always about how do we split the pie. So for example, when I teach tax planning, and I still do this, okay, so I'll, I'll show, my, uh, show where I, I have come from, is that what I'm going to teach students is if I contract, a, pri a private enterprise contracts with a not-for-profit enterprise, or someone else, we can create a win-win. We can split the pie such that we have a win-win. The question becomes, who's the loser? And in the things I teach, the government's the loser, because the government loses tax revenue. And that began to get a little old. And so one of the things I started asking myself is, is there a different way to do it? Is there a way that actually, instead of figuring out how to split the pie, so one of the, pie, the partners loses, is there a way to expand the pie so that everybody wins? And that's really what got me into thinking about public-private partnerships, along with some other experiences that I've had that I'll talk with you about. I need a clicker. So I'm real informal. In fact, uh, I'm gonna give Bruce a hard time. Bruce knows me from Darden, and he asked me, do I wanna stand behind the mic, or do I want a lavalier? And I said, I don't know how to stand behind a podium. So this is, you're gonna see me walking around a lot, so it says P3 to C3. Now, there's nothing special about C3. I'm experimenting with new language, okay? And so we'll get to what that means in a minute. But th what I was excited about with regards to coming here is this is actually brainstorming for me. So how do I think about what we've been doing, the, the, the environment that we've been working in, and a chance to share it with a group of people who are mutually interested. So, so I love this quote, necessity creates partnerships. Because when you think about collaboration, I mean, we, would, we potentially would go it alone if we didn't have some necessity. So if we think about all the different names, whether it be a P3, right, or pay for success, hi Josh, a little nod to Josh there, pay for success, or what I'll call cross-cultural collaboration, that's my own term, we'll explain that in a minute, right? these are all a function of, we have some unmet need and we have a constrained resource. Okay. So if we have an unmet need, right, lots of times, in fact, where P3's public-private partnerships started 
was actually in the infrastructure space like roads. Right? So that's where you saw the birth of P3s. We had infrastructure needs and we actually didn't have the funding. And in fact, we weren't the first. The US wasn't the first. There was far more P3 action going on internationally than there was domestically. This has actually been a recent phenomenon in the United States. It's been going on a lot more in Canada and Australia and UK. And the reason one might contend that that is true is that we haven't had as many constrained resources as other governments, even in the developed economy. You might think, well, why is that? Well, the United States has a robust muni bond market okay, where municipalities can raise funds on their own. Okay? Other countries don't have that. And so by having a muni bond market, there was a source of financing that was available to finance government projects that wasn't necessarily true in other countries. And so to some degree, that sort of prevented us from being innovative in how we think about how we collaborate. Okay? Well then, the financial crisis happened. Debt le national debt levels are high. State debt levels are high. And it's a little harder to issue a muni bond when you've got a lot of debt already. Or you're not really sure where your tax revenues are going to come from because you don't know if you can pay off the debt. You don't know if you can pay your interest on the debt. So there began to be this, okay, now in the United States we are potentially financially constrained. Our ability to, one, access the muni bond market, two, access more tax revenues. One of the things that comes from that is as we become more globalized, one of the issues that everybody struggles with is that when you tax something, if it's mobile, it moves. We see that all the time now. And, and so as the beauty of globalization is that we've learned about so many different ways of doing it. The problem with globalization is everybody wants, is we're not feeling locked into the United States. We know what's out there. And so if you tax something, it potentially will move if it's mobile. And the most mobile thing out there is capital. Money moves easier than people. Right? And so when you've got globalization, the opportunity for things to move overseas, capital can move overseas. Right? So it creates this interesting dynamic where we have forces that are reducing our tax base, we have high debt levels, and so our resources to invest in public, let's call it public infrastructure, public service projects, are coming to a head. The other thing on the unmet need, that says infrastructure, but I think one of the things that's been interesting, and I actually would argue that we've learned from other countries, is while it started in infrastructure, okay, roads, that's basically where it started, right, bridges, moved into buildings, that's still infrastructure, We've seen some of it in renewable energy. Okay. Now we're moving into healthcare services. So when you think of infrastructure, we used to think of infrastructure as buildings, hard, what we call tangible assets. But now what we're seeing is these public-private partnerships are moving into services like education, healthcare. And I would argue that we've gotten a lot of those ideas from the global sector. Because as you move out into the global sector, Again, they're having to use public-private partnerships not only to fund infrastructure, right, but all of these other services. And they've been, especially in the developing world. So if you go and look at the developed world, what they were doing public-private partnerships in was roads, Australia, Canada, the UK. They were doing it in roads. But if you go to look at Africa, they're doing it in services as well. So we started to get some ideas from them. So I always uh, laugh about this because this isn't just about public-private partnerships. Right? This is about any partnership. I'll give you an example. Okay, so my husband, he loves being talked about in front of people. So my husband is a doctor. Right? He's a psychiatrist. And he is, in a sole, he is one of the few remaining sole practitioners. Why? Because psychiatry doesn't require a whole lot of capital investment. You buy a computer, you buy a chair, and you're done, right? We could, he could afford that on his own. He didn't have to buy equipment, he didn't have to, so 
He didn't need a partnership because the capital investment, the amount needed to invest to get something moving wasn't very big, right? And so he stayed a sole practitioner. And that's kind of how I think about if you, the beginnings of public-private partnerships. If you needed a lot of CapEx, capital expenditures, CapEx is a business term, but if you need a lot of capital expenditures like to make capital investment, okay, toll roads, then maybe you needed help in financing, and so you began a public-private partnership. Well, my husband didn't need that. He stayed a sole practitioner. But then one thing he realized is he didn't have know-how. Not doctor know-how. He didn't have business know-how. So public-private partnerships aren't just about what we'll call constrained resources, meaning financial resources. Public-private partnerships are about constrained resources beyond financial resources as well. Know-how. You might have a constrained resources, you don't have the know-how. My husband didn't have the know-how. He didn't know how to run a business. So he employed a partner. But I wasn't really a partner, I was kind of part of the unit. Okay? So his wife, the business professor. Okay? And that works for a while, right? But then, constrained resource, I have a job and two kids, we have two kids, constrained resource became time, right? So there's also time, is it can be a constrained resource. So I want you to think broadly about constrained resources, because constrained resources doesn't just mean money. Okay? It can be know-how, it can be time, it can be um, consumer market, do you understand the market you're gonna work in? All of those are potentially constrained resources, depending on who you are. So this is my little diagram, just to say, really, that what we're going to talk about, or what I, how I think about public-private partnerships, is actually what I'll call, and it's me, cross-sector engagement. And there are many different forms of cross-sector engagement. The first one up there is the P3, and I call that the traditional P3. And the traditional P3 is what I've been talking about, roads. Okay? What we see is, a, and I'll get into this a little bit more, a very contractual partnership to build a road. Now, P3 has taken on a lot of different forms, and people have called them different things. We've got PFS, pay for performance, or pay for success. Okay? And I'll outline how I think that's slightly different than the traditional P3, public-private partnership. And then there's over here, what I was trying to figure out when I was, trying, when I was thinking about talking to you today, I was like, how do I, how do I put a term around what is a little different than what I've seen through what we've, uh, the entries we've seen in our P3 Impact Award that I'll talk about in a little bit. And what I'm calling those right now are C3s just to be cute, because you know, P3, C3s. And so to get the three Cs, I had to make up something. I'll call it cross-cultural collaboration. And I'll, what I'd like to do, okay, is sort of walk through what is similar and different. Okay? And I want to be clear, in my mind, private uh, pub partnerships is not about privatization. Because I think people a lot get, get worried that, oh, this is all about privatizing you know, the economy. No, it's not about privatizing the economy. Okay? I would argue it's really about partnerships in the economy. So the traditional P3, I would say, is typically you see an in infrastructure. So an investment in a road, investment in a building, I think. And it's a multi-year contract over a long period of time. Sometimes it can be 20 to 30 years. It's very finance focused, right? Because you've got big capital investment up front. If you're gonna have big capital investment up front, you better know how you're gonna collect the revenue to pay off the investment. So it's very finance driven. And because of that, you sort of know where your returns are coming from. You have very dedicated returns, so toll roads. Okay. You know where your source of revenue is going to come from. Otherwise, you're not willing to make the capital investment that's needed. Okay. So I'm going to skip over here to pay for success. I see those very similarly, except in one situation. We're doing investment in social services now. Okay. And I think what's really neat about this is we're trying to think through how do we create a structure that helps us think about how we're going to contract okay around creating an objective, a return, that's good for society. And again, usually they're multi-year contracts. I'll say they're finance focused, and the reason I say they're finance focused is because you've got an investor pool coming in. You've got an investor group coming in. Goldman Sachs, I keep looking at Josh because he's sitting right there. Okay? You've got Goldman Sachs coming in to a pay for success. And while they may be patient capital, capital requires a return. 
And so what they need to know is they need to know where that return's gonna come from. Otherwise, they're not gonna put up the investment. Okay? And so that's why I've also got up there, it's finance focused with a dedicated return. Doesn't mean we're not gonna achieve a social outcome, but what we're doing is outlining where are the returns coming from and who's gonna get distributed. When you write the contract, it's about who gets the first return, who gets the second, who's the first person in priority on the return, who gets the latter return, where are the benefits gonna go? It's very contractually laid out. Okay. This third one, it, what I call cross-cultural collaboration, is what we've seen when we've been doing the P3 Impact Awards. And I would argue they're slightly different, though there's a lot in common. Okay. First, where we see them mostly is investment in social services. We see a wide variety of agreements, not necessarily contract specific, but they're agreements because people see mutually beneficial outcomes, not necessarily financial outcomes, okay? direct financial outcomes. And so when I say it's multi-purpose focused, I'll show you what I mean by that. It could be that Microsoft has an innovation they want to test. And so it's not about necessarily them getting the immediate return, it's about them piloting such they can know if it's viable to go later and get a return. So I, I would call it multi that's why I call it multi-purpose. And then that's where the indirect returns come from, because it's not like we're gonna do this partnership and there's a direct return to me. We potentially are gonna do these partnerships because they serve a different purpose that I can then go, or a different objective that I can then use to translate potentially into future returns that are indirectly related to the public-private partnership. And where we've seen a lot of these, these cross-cultural collaborations, is globally. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak to that. So one of the things that, uh, so I'm, I'm a finance accounting professor, and so I can't go on talking about cross-sector collaboration without sort of stepping back and saying, what is it that I think potentially threatens these engagements. And it doesn't matter if it's pay for success, traditional P3s, what I might call cross-cultural collaboration. What threatens any partnership, any alliance, any collaboration? It's the risk. And the question becomes, do we truly understand the risk and are we owning the risk? And I think that's what I would challenge you if you're interested in this space to think about is it's really important to think about the risk and think about them well. When you, see, when you see the Indiana toll road going bankrupt, it's potentially because they didn't think about the risk appropriately. Okay? Well, what kind of risk? And so when I think about risk, I think about three types of risk. So the first kind of risk I think about is what I call finance risk. And that's usually driven because you have a large upfront investment that you usually finance with debt. So you leverage it, okay? When you finance it with debt, debt requires a fixed return, right? An interest payment, it's usually fixed, which then requires that you've gotta pay that. So you need a steady cash flow to pay the return, pay the interest. Well, what that means is your return forecast, what you expect to get from that investment better be estimated correctly, right? So think about toll roads. Where is the money gonna come from a toll road? It's gonna come from people driving on it. Well, if you don't forecast driving right, like who's using it, you won't fat forecast the cash flows right, which will then send the toll roads into bankruptcy. Right? So there's a responsibility both the private and the public sector have in making sure they've stress tested the finance risk. And the other thing that comes up is that what will affect those returns. Drivers not driving. Well, why wouldn't they drive? Well, there might be competition. What well, do you think, competition? How can there be competition for toll roads? There's just other ways to drive. There are other roads to drive on. People don't want to pay. They may take a little longer. So you've got to think about the unintended consequences. When you, they may look absolutely perfect until you forget that there's a competitor that is not sort of loud, yelling that they're going to compete with you. It's a silent competitor. There's an alternative, there's an option. So you've got to think about all the risks that affect your financing. 
I would also argue you need to think about operation risk. And I put some things down here that I would sort of talk about as operation risk, which is completion risk. Okay. Is it going to get done? Right. Have you and your team, your partners thought about how it's going to get done? Regulatory risk. Okay. I think that one goes unsaid, right? We can think of lots of examples of regulatory risk. The problem, one of the problems that's unique to partnerships, especially public-private partnerships across sector engagement, is they can be really complex because you're trying to meet a lot of needs. Okay? And if they're complex, that imposes risk, especially when it comes to transparency, because the more complex something is, the less transparent something is. So that's, I would, there, I'm sure there are others, but these are some ways. And then finally, this is the most important. It always comes down to humanity, right? So we can structure the perfect P3, the perf cross, perfect cross-sector, with all the contracts set up perfectly well, but if we don't have the talent pool, if we don't have the leadership, if we don't have the political will, I, call the, I lump all these as human risk. We don't understand the culture. We don't have trust. It doesn't matter how well planned it is, it's not going to work. Okay? So you've got to go through all your risk and do risk management, whether it be sort of the hard number stuff, finance risk, or the soft, really important stuff, the human risk to think about. So I'm going to walk through one, I think, real quick. OK, so this is, I've got three, but I'm not sure we're going to have time. So the first one is, this is uh, the female health company, which I work with. This is how I got involved in public-private partnerships. So I want to share this with you. This was in the United States, but we got this idea from an international, our, our efforts internationally. So we imported this idea. And the question becomes, this is the reason I don't think of this as your typical P3, is notice what's happening here, is it's the company with the product. So you, the company actually needs market research. It needs a distribution channel because its market can't afford its product. Okay? So that's a different lens with which to think about public-private partnerships. Notice that DC Department of Health and Human Services, they provided the marketing. Really? The government agency providing the marketing? What do I mean by that? Well, they had contact with the consumer. The people who needed the female health company produces the female condom. Prevents HIV, okay, spread of AIDS, STDs. Okay, it's, it is the only product that a woman controls to protect herself. Okay. Well, we've got to reach the consumer. We, we actually partnered with DC Health and Human Services to reach out to the people who most needed it. Because the problem is in DC, there's an epidemic of HIV. So you see the social problem? There's a social problem. We have an epidemic of HIV in certain communities in DC. And the company I work with has a product that we can't reach that consumer. The Mac Foundation provided the grant because we, and we provided the, the condoms at wholesale. Okay? Now you might ask, why didn't we provide them for free? We could have, but we were struggling. Right? So if we continue to give away from things for three, we've got to pay rent. We've got to pay employees. So we've got a product we have to provide. So we partnered with the Mac Foundation to help provide the funding. And then, oh, sorry, CVS. One of the interesting things, this is the know-how transfer that happens in a public-private partnership. One thing Health and Human Services said was, this isn't going to work. It will not work unless you figure out a way for people to be able to get the condoms after hours. I mean, we hadn't even thought about that. Why? Well, sex doesn't happen in nine to five, right? <laughs> and so, again, I say health and human resources, they were our market research. They understood the consumer. We didn't, right? And it would have taken too much of our resources to understand. And so what they helped us realize is that we had to partner with a, a pharmacy okay, or a drugstore to make sure that there's 24-hour access. 24 hour access okay? Now, I could go through. What we, we also, the other thing that we did that I would encourage you to think about is we partnered with John Hopkins, who did a research paper on this public-private partnership so that we could be able to show 
whether it was successful or not. And what they would say is that every dollar investment in this public-private partnership saved $20 in health and human services cost with, related to HIV. Okay? So now everything is in the assumptions. I'll honor that. Okay? So you can pull that research paper apart if you want to. But the point being is that having another partner, John Hopkins, on the end, who helps you assess and collect and think about the data. So that inspired, along with working with amazing people, that inspired the P3 Impact Award, which has been going on uh, through the Institute of Business and Society at Darden. Uh, it's a partnership. Actually, this is a partnership. Concordia is a not-for-profit. Even though Darden is a not-for-profit, we're going to call it the profit part because we're a business school. And then we've got the State Department, which is a government, a government agency or department. So what this, the idea behind this award was to honor those creative, innovative partnerships that are looking at how to address social problems in a unique way across sectors. Okay. And so the 2014 winner was Coco Link. <coughs> And I, so Hershey had a problem. Instability in cocoa prices. Cocoa prices are all over the place. Why? Because farm, cocoa farmers are small. They don't have a lot of expertise in farming methods. Right? And so they weren't being very efficient. And the demand for cocoa was skyrocketing. I mean, everybody wants dark chocolate now, right? I know I do. So that was, I must have been the person, you know. So what was happening is the World Cocoa Foundation was trying to help people farm better. The biggest cash crop in Ghana is cocoa. So this idea did not come from the government. This idea came from an executive at Hershey. And what he said was, hmm, how can we get a more stable production of cocoa? So it benefits us, right? Stability in cocoa prices, that would be nice. But it will also benefit the farmers because they will be more efficient in their production and therefore yield a better income and we will end up with a win-win. So they formed Cocoa Link, which uses cell phones to distribute information about farming. So the, cocoa, the Ghana Cocoa Board provides the information. It's texted out through cell phones to the farmers, and they get education, online education through texting. Okay? And so, and Hershey helped support this. Well, yield went up 40%, and income in, for Ghana farmers went up 70%. Okay? So again, partnering for better social outcomes. This year's winner, wow, that's a lot of partners, okay? This year's, part, uh, this year's partner or partnership is fascinating. It's called TV White Space. And TV White Space, I'm, I'm not a tech person. TV White Space, is that part of the spectrum, whatever that means, okay, that nobody uses, okay? And we, we'd like to use it. And Microsoft's been thinking about how could we use it? How can we use it to help get access, internet access, out to the most remote regions in the world? Well, they needed a laboratory. So this isn't about financing need. They didn't, I mean, Microsoft's got plenty of money. They needed a place to pilot, a place to innovate, a place to, do, to show that this would actually provide real benefits. And so what they did is they said, well, there is this program in the Philippines where they're trying to do sustainable fishery. But how do you read? Has anybody ever been to the Philippines? What's it like? How do you like? There's lots of islands and use dugouts and use dugouts. And use what? Yeah, it's hard to get around. It's hard to talk to people, right? It's hard to, so how do you reach the fishermen? They're all over the place. It's really difficult to do that. And so what they've been trying to do is figure out how to reach out to the fishermen in the Philippines. So what they did, again, this is using technology. They connected them through the TV white space. They registered them in the USAID's project on sustainable fishery. It's the EcoFish over here. And they needed the government support because the people of the Philippines needed to know this was a, needed to know they were behind it. Okay. 
And so they implemented this, and uh, the SSG advisors, because this is such a complicated partnership, they're actually the managers of the whole project. Okay? So there was an assigned manager there. And they implemented that, and I've got the data here. It's like 25%, uh, that's what it is, 25% of the new applicants over a nine month period were driven specifically by this partnership. Okay? So th they were trying to register over nine months. They got 16,000. 25% of that, though, was driven by this partnership, which is a big return. But it's not just about that. This is how you have to think about all the benefits. Because you know what? There was an earthquake, a 7.2 earthquake in the Philippines during that time. And the only source of communication was this TV white space. Okay? So they helped there. Now they can actually reach out to schools. So it's not just about fishing. So now the schools on the islands communicate. Community centers have access to the internet. Okay? And you think, well, great, that's terrific. And where's Microsoft's benefit? Well, you know where Microsoft's intending to do this? Rural Virginia. So what we learn overseas, we can also transport home. Because there are places in the United States that don't have access to the internet. Okay? So what's interesting about them is using this as a time period, or uh, an example of an, in I call it an iLab. This is their iLab for getting things done. So in conclusion, y'all have been really patient. Uh, I think that it's pretty obvious P3s form where we have an unmet need and constrained resources. Okay? And they allow for us to share risk, but we need to think and own those risks and be responsible for those risks. Don't run away from them. Okay? We've all got to embrace them and figure out how to best allocate them. So uh, when we think about training, I would argue that we should all be training in risk management. Both on the for profit side and the nonprofit or the governmental side. The big point here is P3s have expanded beyond infrastructure. And I think the bin, so from my point of view as a private enterprise person, is that the big win is not about the, re, the direct returns for the private sector, it's that it brings us new ways and new places to think about how we might innovate, how we might gather information that we don't have, and get indirect returns, not necessarily direct returns. And a good example of those would be TV white space and um, the Cocoa Link. Okay. And I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know if anybody, thank you for coming. I don't know if anybody has any questions or not. I mean, it's been a fascinating, it's been fascinating to hear Josh. Uh, I came to the Pay for, Perform, Pay for Success uh, forum, and it was really, it's been really interesting to see how many different groups are trying to do very similar things. And this is, a, I would consider this a very new space, right? Especially in the United States, because we have all these different mechanisms, but they're sort of not, they're not tested. And anytime anything's tested, not tested, it's risky, right? So pay for success has these issues where what they've got to do is figure out the ones that will, uh, that pay for success works are the ones where we have data and evidence that supports there's a financial return, right? So that you can contract out where well, there aren't a whole lot of areas where we have that kind of research. And education, help me. Workforce development. Workforce development. Okay. There are other places. But I think it's fascinating. Thanks so much. Um, I just got back from a conference in New York where we were presenting some research on what is some people are calling collective impact. So they're kind of P3s on steroids, talking like hundreds of organizations. And one thing that we really struggled with is that this is all the rage right now. There's been a number of articles in the Stanford Social Innovation Review about them. Uh, people are interested. What we found, we were trying to be really systematic and social, you know, social scientific about it. Um, but the definition is really difficult, and the structures are, as many cases as we found, there are different structures. So I was wondering, for your P3 awards, how do you define them, and, and then do you struggle with, like, of all of the applicants or p nominations that come forward, is it like comparing apples and oranges? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I found that to be the hardest. That's very comforting to hear that you had the same conversation. I think that that has been our experience as well. Um, we left it broad intentionally. Uh, one of the things people said, well, does a public-private partnership have to include a government agency or a government? And we actually came down on no. Uh, we felt like it could be 
not-for-profit and private, meaning business, right? Or it could be not-for-profit and government. I mean, we, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible to know where really the cross-sector collaboration was happening. Uh, and as you said, what we've witnessed is it's happening everywhere and it's happening in many different forms. And I think that's fun, but hard, right? It's fun because you realize how many creative opportunities there are to problem solve, especially these uh, very difficult social problems that we have. It gives me a lot of hope because when I listen to the news right now, I don't have a lot of hope. So listening to how creative people are being about how they're solving social issues is just great. It makes it hard from a, the researcher in me it makes it really hard to say something because everything's different. Everyone is different. But we're working on that. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I just wanted to ask how you felt um, the data collection part of this goes into a lot of these particular nonprofits and um, organizations that aren't necessarily comfortable with this data collection process. Uh, I know that's something um, Josh and I have been talking about a lot this year, is that how do you go about pushing numbers onto a group that's maybe not necessarily um, that comfortable or that familiar with the data collection process? So it's funny you ask that question, because in, in, in my head, what that, where it says talent risk is that. Where is, is the talent equal on either side in multiple scenarios, like for multiple things. It could be finance numbers oriented, it could be EQ qualitative oriented. But one of the things I always hear is, and you, when I was reading a bunch on what went wrong potentially with some of the P3s and the, and the toll roads, the infrastructure space, it's when you get in these, they're very complex. And so the financing of them can be very complex. And I actually would challenge, I would actually challenge the policy students challenge you because if this is where we're if this is where we're going right the financing is going to be more and more and more part of what's going on and to be a good representative to be a good policy representative you can't run away from the numbers right and so i do i think it's a huge challenge so the then that's where trust comes in because now let's say i'm the business person and you're the policy person right and i'm giving you a bunch of numbers Either you trust me, if you run from it, that's a problem, right? If you trust me and we've worked together, then we might, we might be okay, right? But if we don't have that trust, then where are we gonna be, right? So I think that that's a very difficult situation and I'll just come back and I'll challenge you. I challenge my business school students all the time on this because they're getting all this finance training. But if they don't know how to communicate that finance training in a way that people who don't have that training or don't work in it every day are not comfortable with it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna run, you're not gonna trust them. And so it is not just on the policy students or the policy people or the business people, it's on both, right? The business students have to get really good at explaining, but there's also a part of you wanna empower yourself to take more control, take more ownership. So I, I would challenge you on that respect, not just you, potentially. No, you know, I didn't mean just you. Yeah, okay. Does that help? Okay. Hey, Thanks for coming over. Hey. Yeah. Um, the idea of indirect returns presumably makes a lot of people nervous, uh, particularly funders. Um, how much do people in this space have to work through that sort of cloud of indirect returns dealing with fisheries in the Philippines, but this could help education or rural Virginia or, you know, some of those are pie in the sky. I'm not expecting them to work. Some will work, but we don't know which ones. Uh, how do we articulate that? Yeah, I would, I would think of, you need to know, you need to have an objective, right? So the fisheries was, we want to, our objective is to register more fishermen because we want to create a more sustainable fishing system, fishing ecosystem. The positive externalities, I'll sort of, the positive benefits that come because we've set that up, great, right? But it seems like right now what we have to be comfortable with is that first one. If we're not comfortable with the first one and that being the good objective, then it's harder to get people on board. They gotta be, if we get the extra stuff even better, right? Well, there's sort of, 
let's define it where we know we can probably get and measure the impact and feel good about that, and then always be on the lookout for the spillovers, right? And because it's important. Be, lots of times people think it's the upfront that it's important. It's, it's the upfront, it's the implementation, and then it's the follow-up that are important because the follow-up is what allows us to continue. What we learn what's good, what's bad, you know, where to cut things off, move on. So I think that you know, the, from the indirect return space, I don't think we think about, I mean, maybe we have an inkling, but I don't think you get people on board because of that. I think you have to have one, personally, I think you have to have one defined thing. With Microsoft, I mean, I think they're, you know, they knew what they wanted, right? They wanted a pilot. Right? They wanted to be able to test it. They probably had more of a vision of where it could go if it worked, right? But for the government coming on, they needed to have a very explicit, right? I think the other thing question though is, to some degree, what's, what do they have to, the other part is what are the opportunities? What do they have to lose by not getting involved? If those, they don't have much to lose, then why not get involved? Hey, Scott. Thank you, this is <clears throat> really, really interesting. Um, it, it seems so complicated, I can't imagine that any of these ever succeed because who's driving the ship? Well, you know, it's the one human risk up there. I didn't really speak to this, which, but I would like to, is uh, leadership. The reason I got involved with the Tri-Sector Leaders Program, uh, which was started by a student who's both an MPP student and an MBA student, okay, uh, is because of public-private partnerships and this effort. Because when I think about one of the biggest risks that we have in making these work is that we have a lack of leadership that really understands across sectors to be able to make these move forward. When, when you, all the research that's been done so far suggests that champions, like having a good champion within the organization is what really helps these move forward. If you have a champion, a leader, who's not good across sectors, that's a real problem because then it affects the trust, right? Somebody who really understands the cultural differences, really important. And so that's actually, for me, why I got into the Tri-Sector Leaders Program was all in when Annie said go, because I firmly believe if we're gonna make these work, we have to have a future generation of leaders who understand across sectors, not just within their sector. Do they always initiate from the company, so say female health company, Microsoft, or is it ever that the government is saying, hey, could, could we partner with you to solve this Good question. problem? Uh, so the, the ones I've seen have been that's interesting. I'm sure that is not true. Uh, I'm sure what I'm about to say is not true. The ones I've seen have been started by the companies because they had a direct need. It wasn't necessarily a financial need. They wanted to grow a product or a market. And they couldn't, they recognized they couldn't do it on their own because it was in areas that they didn't have expertise in. For the female health company, it was they didn't have expertise in how to reach inner city DC. We don't have expertise in that. We know how to make a female condom. We know how to do that really well. No idea how to reach that part of the population, right? For Microsoft, it was, we've got a great technology product. No idea how to do, reach fishermen in, you know, in the Philippines. Same thing with Hershey, right? I mean, the interesting, and see, this is a, what I think is really interesting about this is once you have success in one, the question is where can, what are the incremental steps? So one of the finalists, they didn't win, but one of the finalists for this year was Partners for Food Solutions, of which Hershey is a partner of it, along with Carhill and a bunch of other like General Mills. Okay? And what they're doing, they're taking executives or people who have been trained in good uh, farming practices, not just cocoa. See where this is going? Not just good farming practices, but they are now creating tutoring programs where people like, let's say they're retired executives or retired people who know a lot about a particular area of farming, they call in or they do sort of online tutoring, I'll call it, with people all over the emerging markets to help them be better at growing. Does that sound like Cocoa Link? It's just we've taken Cocoa Link's ideas and we've expanded it in different ways to reach different audiences. So. I mean, if we can do them well and then sort of take incremental steps, there's no telling. And I don't believe that one potentially came from 
companies. But I think, I mean, I think if a government want, had something, they, they've got to think about what's the win-win, right? And I think sometimes understanding what the win, for, for government or for policy to understand what the win is for business, I would encourage you to think beyond the immediate bottom line. And what I mean by that is, yes, they care about the bottom line. But Microsoft's was about the future bottom line, right? The government gave them a place to pilot, right? To some degree, that's what DC did. They gave us a place to figure out how it was that we were going to reach this underserved population in the female health company, right? So if you can understand the incentives of a business, it's not just about getting the dollar today, it's about their growth potential. And, it, and I think that if, a, if government recognized that, that you get more, maybe more impetus from the government. But you know, I have to give the State Department a lot of credit. I mean, the State Department has a whole office on global partnerships, and they are facilitating these around, they are actively looking for businesses. So as I say that with one, you know, I said it was business driven on one hand, I actually am gonna step over and go, well, wait a second, at least in the international space, the State Department has played a huge role, and uh, Drew O'Brien, in his role as uh, head of that department, has been a very, um, an amazing force for the government in that area. So, long-winded answer. Brian. Well, let's thank Mary Margaret Frank Thanks. for speaking with us today. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.